Talon, PaperX, GenG, and DRX. All of them failed. On the stage where it mattered the most, and in their own home, they were beaten. Worse than they have ever before. But why? Let's have a look. 2024 has been an extremely tumultuous year for the Pacific, and it ended with the most unexpected finish in Valorant history of this region. A season that gave us both the highest of highs, but also the worst ever World Champions Climax for the Pacific. We saw the rise in absolute dominance of Gen.G, the Korean super team that was written off in the off-season when it was formed. A squad that was assumed to not amount to much, I am guilty of that too, they absolutely tore down the entire world this year by making an astonishing five back-to-back -back finals appearances and winning three out of the possible five titles, which included Pacific's first ever Masters Trophy in Shanghai. It was a moment that truly, truly made every single fan from the Pacific, irrespective of who they supported, a little teary-eyed because after three years of hard work, Genji finally broke that final curse which PaperX carried on their shoulders for years now. It almost seemed like the perfect story being written as we headed into Champs 2024 because it was fated that it would be the year that the champions came to Pacific, more specifically Seoul, the heart, warmth and home of Genji. A Korean team going to the biggest Valorant event of the year on the back of a Masters and VCT Pacific win just mere days ago as the favourites after winning so much already in their own hometown? It was like a fairy tale being woven into reality with the golden touch of a tiger. It almost seemed fated that they would at least be in the top two, but fate has a cruel way of playing its way out. With a slightly out of sync and predictable yet powerful paper X, an inexperienced but exciting talent, a burnt out world champion Gen G, and the only fresh and strong thing to come out of the Pacific this time around being DRX, things were somehow looking bleak even before champions began. Even then, people had faith in Gen G. But there was a clear question in the air whether or not the Pacific could have a team do something more besides Gen G in champions. To understand this better, I also spoke to some of the experts from our region, one of the best VC the Pacific talents, William Chobra, and watch party and Jinx Queen in the Pacific, Dash Bunny. Here's what they had to say. For the whole year, I think I'm just going to talk about Gen G right now. They've been consistent as heck. Top threes, uh, grand finals, winning uh, you know, the trophies, I think twice, uh, one in Masters Shanghai and one in Pacific itself. So I think that's already a big achievement to talk about. Oh yeah, kickoff as well, that's right. So, the consistency is definitely there for them. And I think it's a shocker to everyone that they didn't even make it into playoffs. And I, there's only a few things that I can say. Number one, they got countered hard, read very hard. And this is, not to say they weren't prepared, but I think under preparation is definitely a thing. Given the fact that they are one of the teams that have played some of the most maps this year. Uh, the team that has, I think they've gone to every single major event this year. Uh, alongside uh, playing onto the regular season, I don't think they had a lot of time to prep or even prepare, you know, new new strats, new starts, styles of play, or prepare for new maps compared to other teams. I mean, look at DRX. They are a team that came in really strong, and I think this is very Paper X-ish during Pearl time. You know, it was kind of like the mindset where the team that learns the latest map, the fastest, will be able to come up on top. DRX definitely had that. And unfortunately for Gen.G, you know, they weren't able to prep and, you know, start new things. How many times have they played the same maps over and over? I think at this point, we can sort of like tell what's their map pool, how they're going to be playing every single map. Yeah, the raw aim is there, but against teams like Sentinels, who are so good, you know, Kaplan is so great at counter stratting and reading them, what can you do? So I think that's definitely one of the biggest factors there, uh, especially for Genji. And I think number two, I, I think for, I think, you know, if you talk about Paper X, I think the lack of time also contributed as well. Given the fact that they started off the year with Munit and they swapped back to Jing, like how much time did they have to really prepare with Jing, to really cook up strats with Jing again? I think in this situation, yeah, they've been, you know, prepping and playing strats around Jing for a long time. But like, you need time for players like Jing to really integrate themselves into the team again compared to before. I think he had like, what, a five month break before that? So what can you do in that situation if the schedule is this way? I think uh, if anything, it's gotta have to be the schedule if anything. I mean, you could argue the same or the opposite for Team Heretics, 
But Team Heretics also did tweet out. I think Nelzinho tweeted out as well as Wood said, saying that they are tired as well. And they did have quite an abysmal performance in Split 2. They bounced back over in Champions. So that could possibly also be a thing. How do you feel Pacific's year so far has been? That's a that's a really good question. I think it's an important question because I think um, all of us had really, really high expectations uh, towards the end of the year just because of the peaks that Pacific had, right? Namely, yeah. obviously, Gen G bringing home the first Pacific trophy ever internationally. And that's huge. And that should be celebrated. Uh, and it looked like, hey, is this, you know, finally the start of us having, you know, a world-class team and them challenging each other? Obviously, in the past, there was Paper Rice and DRS. They, all, they always fell short. Uh, now things are going to change. Uh, and, you know, I think, it, obviously, we hyped it up on the broadcast as well. And yeah. I, I, know I don't regret that. But if you... Think back objectively now that the dust has settled. I yeah. think it's fair to say DRX has had a rocky year. I know their results in um like in the league play and group stages were always good, but obviously, you know, they changed their IGL in the middle of the year. They mm -hmm. have a bunch of new rookies. So it's been, you know, it's a year where we shouldn't have had as high expectations. Yeah. Uh paper. Yeah, and then Paper Rex also, right? Roster changes kind of back and forth. And then there were always signs of them trying to, you know, figure out how much they want to evolve versus keep, you know, stay true to W Gaming. Mm. So that hasn't been as dominant as, you know, in the past, I would say. Yeah. Uh, especially last year. Um, and then Talon Esports, obviously, the, the theme for Talon has always been, okay, the ideas are cool, the execution is lacking, and you're trying to build on that, right? That's been yeah. their whole year. So when you look at it that way, I think the only one that's truly, truly a shame, and I guess you could argue disappointing from a fan perspective, is, in my opinion, Gen G. Yeah. Um, yeah, just because they've looked so good. Uh, now, obviously, we can get to that later on why we think that happened, but... Mm -hmm. When I pick it apart objectively, um, I mean, it feels bad just because only one team made it to playoffs in the top eight. So yeah. obviously that kind of sucks. But then you think about the overall years and it's like, okay, it's actually not. I mean, I'm in the camp of it's not as surprising as it seemed in the beginning. I mean, I would argue that for Paper Rex, you know, not to not to harp on them, but just because of the group they had and, you know, their final matchup was EDG and that's a matchup that they're familiar with and they, mm -hmm. you know, should have played better, I think. So, yeah, sure, there's a chance that they probably should have made it to playoffs, but yeah. they didn't. And I think that just kind of sums up the whole year for a lot of these teams. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many Pacific fans are going to be happy to hear that, but I think it's kind of ah uh, you know what the signs were kind of there um mm -hmm. you know there could have been higher peaks but it's also not like a oh my gosh what happened a type of scenario after every pacific team finished their first game a few things cleared up gen and drx were in full control prx was struggling to keep up with their own identity and hence getting caught off guard and talent while showing promise unfortunately were getting outplayed by their own inexperience of being on the big stage because this is their first time ever while everyone expected Gen G and DRX to get out of their group and PRX to at least finish as the bottom seed beating Foot and EDG, Talon was in a group of death with an Americas and EMEA giant alongside an absolute crazy out of nowhere Tracy Sports. It was not possible for them to get out of that group. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a team that hadn't yet built, a, a, like you said, a habit of closing out games, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there we people like to talk about the winning habit and it's a very real thing and it happens with rounds it happens with maps it happens with matches so uh, i think understanding that patience will pay off uh is something that this team struggles with and i think the players and the coaching staff are all pretty open about it as well i think they all admit that yeah well, that's where we fall short right we get we get excited or we get desperate and then we start just like throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks uh, and you start to throw the prep out the window and, and the comms start to break down. Uh, and it's gotten, I, I would actually say that it's gotten better over the year, mm -hmm. but obviously still, and then they had Primi come in. So there's still been roster changes with that. And yeah. so it hasn't stabilized yet. Uh, and I think when they think it's close, that's when we start to see them play a bit messier. Uh, they used to overheat a lot, even just in the middle of the map, which I think that has been fixed mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, just running the full course of, of a match and closing it out is something that they haven't uh, had as much experience with. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's like, there's no hope. I just think 
you know, there's so many things that they were brushing up on. And I think they were always aiming to be so perfect, like so good, yeah. right? Like the whole multiple comps and all the maps and that's all great, but that's like, that's a lot of work. That's mm. a lot of work. So I think these were very, very big goals that probably made it harder for them to perfect like two or three things rather than 10. But while everyone was writing their scripts with obviously Jen coming out. Genji, yeah, their symbol is the tiger. But I feel like we're the tiger now and they're the cat. <laughs> and, we're, and, we're, and we're coming for blood. <laughs> Can he arrive? No. Hold the line, the flash in his face. He will crumble to the home crowd. Every single member crumbling. Tonight, soul burns red. Sentinel survive. The unthinkable. Both heretics and sentinels got their revenge as heretics managed to make a monster mentality come back on that third map, while sentinels just grew stronger with every game and found a wounded Gen G in the elimination match who they studied really well. Gen G was sent home from the groups, something I'm pretty sure no one expected, or at least 95% of the fans. It could just be a case of honest burnout but at the worst time possible, at the one event it mattered the most. They started losing duels that were usually seen by them winning, and the fact that Sentinels were actually ready for Gen G's basic protocols. They studied them hard and it was clear, and to be honest, countered them with controlled individual brilliance. Sen found their Masters Madrid form back on, on the form of some rugged homework against a team that's played the most amount of Valorant this year. Um, so I think Sentinels, the, the final match against Sentinels, the rematch was a combination of, you know, their patterns starting to get read by a lot of teams around the world, but also the impact the loss against Heretics had. I, I do think that had a pretty big impact, mm -hmm. um, where one of the biggest benefits that Genji had was they had a good foundation of defaults and protocols that made them just flexible enough and then this is also a team that I'm going to say relied a lot on their aim as well, like their mm. firepower. Um, yeah. You know, not in the same fashion of Paper X, but when you're when you're playing the same or similar defaults the whole entire year, you at, at a certain point you have to frag, and they rely a lot on contact plays to create space and get information. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it was always the argument of okay, if texture is not fragging, meteor is right. There's always a counterpart, so there's mm. always like two and a half people that are fragging out, or at least three people across an entire best of three uh, that keeps them going. The moment they lost to heretics and two members just were not fragging, you know, comparatively at all, right? Namely, in in Munchkin and Lakia, I believe, uh, against heretics. Now that confidence is just going to falter because uh, yeah. it's like okay, well, now even that's not working, right? Now we're scared to challenge, uh, and that's kind of how we used to get information. So now our entire protocol is picked apart because uh, now we're scared to do that, and then we start to see them, like, they played really messy against Sentinels, which is something mm. we just haven't seen them do all year. And I think part of that was individuals starting to feel like, okay, like, the team's struggling. I need to do this. Like, I need to go create space. I need to go get contact alone. I need to go get kills alone. And that's how we get information because the rest of our util protocol relies on the initial contact. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think the I think the defeat to Heretics actually impacted the loss to to Sentinels a lot. But also, um, I would say that the same credit goes to both Heretics and Sentinels because it's not like there was a week in between, right? There was only one day. So I would say that there's the same credit to both of them in that both of them prepared really well. Uh, yeah. against Gen.G. I think they had very hard reads on the tendencies of Munchkin and how he calls. I think they had very good reads, not just mid-rounding, but like round-to-round -round adjustment of, okay, this is Gen.G's tendency. Like, if they lose this type of round, this is how they try to bring it back in the next round. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also maneuvered the draft uh, excellently, both of them. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to take any credit away from Heritage and uh, Sentinels. I think both of them uh, played really well against Gen.G. They came prepared, but also... After the Heretics loss, I think Genji played even worse because now the confidence falters and a lot of your play was based on confidence. When we thought this was all going to be the hardest loss we take, we saw PRX fall to EDG in a fashion we did not expect at all. After a demolition of a first map 13-3, everyone thought EDG cannot come back from this. 
but we all thought wrong because Smoggy and Chichu basically took over the game in map 2 and 3 and Paper X suffered one of their most tremendous losses we've seen on Lotus. They went crashing out of the groups to a team they've only ever lost once to in all the times they've faced them. It was heartbreaking to see Paper X at their lowest ever since their inception. They were clearly being outclassed when it came to purely a strategic standpoint because they became extremely predictable. It was visible in the G2 game and the EDG game too. The control of the team on the pace seemed to have loosened up a bit and their playstyle clearly looked a little flaky in the way that they wanted to approach the game this year and it took a hit on their form. After Jing came back having his time away from the team and it somehow just wasn't working the way it used to before. Him on the Neon was something I personally questioned a little bit because I still believe given the chance, Forsaken is one of the best Neon players in the world. But because something is in on the team, the team dynamic wouldn't allow for Forsaken to play that role unless Monyet was still around, who also can play the Neon better in my opinion. At this point, the Pacific was falling apart. Something that we can be talking about as well, about why we are there, but I think, in, if anything, Pacific seemed stagnant. They weren't able to really change the way they played, change the mindset. The, the top of the barrel are constantly going to every single event. How many times have we seen from, from kickoff all the way till now, Paper X is still running the same comp and meta over in Sunset? No changes, nothing. Of course it's going to be hard red. The, the fact that they don't have an IGL, because when things start to go you know, go bad. Like everyone is all over the place and they can't seem to be on that same page. A good IGL or a caller would be great for them to give a little bit more structure. And I'm really looking forward to our paper to be able to do that. I think, I think when you when you bring that up, it does bring a good point. Jing's agent pool. Uh, I think I talked about this on my streams myself about, I think we've only seen Jing run the Rays as well as the Sage on Icebox. And he did try his hand at running that Neon and it wasn't great. It, it wouldn't give that unpredictability or the speed that we saw Forsaken was able to bring into the team. And, you know, for me personally, having a player like Forsaken on that Neon might be better than putting him on that Cypher. DRX successfully beat out the giant that is Fnatic in the group stage to come out on top as the first seed, becoming the only Pacific team to make it to the playoffs. After a dominating second map on Lotus, Buzz and Marco tore through Fnatic like it was nothing. They came in as a stronger team by a mile. At this point, a bit of history would have started peering through their minds. Istanbul 2022, where it was a similar situation, where DRX were the only APAC team in the playoffs and managed to go all the way to the top three. But Sentinels had just started getting warmed up. Again, a performance of absolute brilliance from Zekin, who showed how dangerous that Neon is when wielded in the right hands. They became the Pacific beaters at this point. Genji first, now DRX. But DRX's journey wasn't over just yet. Lower brackets are what they were known for. They've made some of their most legendary runs there. It started off extremely well against Trace with a dominant duo sending them back home from their fairy tale. But next was an opponent that would haunt them who've constantly been among the top three best teams in the world this season. Heretics. A team with solid fundamentals and chemistry who are absolute mentality monsters and it showed in this series. A do or die where they needed and had to make a comeback happen, they did it in the most heretics way possible. Absolute teamwork. With a touch of magic. Of individuality. Abyss was first up and I don't think anyone had a doubt how DRX would play this. One of, if not probably, the best team in the world right now on Abyss destroyed Heretics 13-5. It was inevitable because Marco's calling and fragging was immaculate on this one and they were in complete control. And then on Sunset, Heretics demonstrated Newton's third law and gave an equally strong reply by winning their map of Sunset 13-5 with some beautiful retakes orchestrated by Rians and Boo. And then came Icebox, where Pacific's final light bulb went out after DRX absolutely not being able to keep their head in the game and the lead that they had on, in their hand on their defense. The retakes were just misaligned. Most importantly, Heretics had a very interesting incision point to pressure DRX. The pressure that they put on at first in the post plant, which was given to them pretty often at the exact moment when DRX started flooding in. The minute that happens, DRX get a little flickery about taking these fights because it tangles with their decision and protocol of 
creating and taking space on the site amidst taking head-on fights being given to them by heretics with a little bit of utility support. Heretics exploited that very well and instantly fall back to play on their util for the end and crossfire set up to finish off things while individually also they started stepping up. They strung fire rounds together in a row at the end to send the final Pacific team home just a few blocks away. For the first time since 2021, the Pacific team failed to make it to the top four at champions. And for the first time since 2021, only one Pacific team managed to make it to the top eight. And once again, it was DRX. In the same year that we won our first ever Masters Trophy, we had our worst Valorant Champions performance as a region. If this isn't Pacific in a nutshell, I don't know what it is. Having two extremes in the same year, just a couple of months apart. The Pacific region gave us everything this year. Tears of happiness and frowns of sadness. No matter what happens, Pacific will always be the best region for the whole lot of us as we look to the next season now, while hoping that we see a new Pacific team, a different Pacific region, bring home another international trophy.